Okay, so I'll keep it fairly general today and we can go to some specific derivations and things on Friday. So the basic idea of stability for a, a fluid mechanician is, um, you know, uh, built into this thought about whether you want laminar flow, whether you want turbulent flow, and how you go from one to the other. So typically, laminar flows go through a series of instabilities, and then they go towards turbulence. Uh, turbulence also can become unstable and go to laminar. So we are, we are going to talk mainly about the first thing, like how a laminar flow goes unstable. So a lot of um, industrial uh, people, as well as atmospheric and earth scientists, are very interested in this problem about instabilities. Uh, you may want to design a thing to be laminar or lint. So, for example, if a, a washing machine had laminar flow where every fluid particle went along a streamline, then obviously your clothes are not going to get clean. So the flow is just going to go past your clothes and nothing will happen. So uh, you need turbulence in some situations, and nobody knows how to uh, design for one or the other from a first principles point of view. So that's what we're going to talk about. OK, so this is just a title I've given here to show how difficult it is to decide whether you want laminar flow, turbulent flow, how difficult it is to predict what's, how one is going to go unstable or the other is going to happen. So uh, in aircraft wings, people want as much of the wing to be laminar as possible. So if you have more of the wing to be laminar, then your drag comes down. So in order to do that, there are various prescriptions. People try out like a whole variety of things to keep the wing as laminar as possible. So the interesting thing is that here's the wing. You suck out the boundary layer. That is supposed to help. You blow into the boundary layer. That is also supposed to help. So you're doing two completely opposite things, and both of them can keep it laminar, or both of them can increase turbulence. So it is like that. So the general message I want to give it give is that it's not easy. You have to uh, calculate these things for each particular case, and uh, lots of times contradictions come up, and we will talk about that again and again here. I should use this. OK. So we'll talk about stability now. Very often, you see patterns like this, which arise out of instability. None of this is turbulence. So in all these cases, there is some kind of nonlinear saturation where a wavelength or a length scale is decided by the linear stability. And this thing has gone nonlinear later on and saturated in some way so that you see interesting patterns like these. So you can see patterns like this all around you. So next time you see th such a pattern, think of us and start wondering what stability problem or what stability mechanism created this pattern. OK, so I'll just show this movie about sand ripples to give an idea about instability. I have to go to YouTube. So you see how the wave is moving this way? So basically, like there's wind blowing in that direction, and the pattern is created normal to the wind. So here's the wind coming. It's picking up sand particles. Um, so you've started out with a small perturbation like this. The wind is picking up the sand particles from the windward side and dumping them into the leeward side. Oops, that's enough. Yeah, dumping them into the leeward side. So you saw this wave moving slowly. So this is what is characteristical of a lot of instabilities. So you create a perturbation. So let's say you had a flat interface of sand at first. 
you made that into a slightly undulated interface of sun, and then you uh, blew wind from this side. So the sun particles were lifted off from here and dumped on this side, lifted off from here and dumped on this side. And what sets the length scale is a very complicated problem. Like in uh, sand ripple studies, there are several different mechanisms which give rise to unbelievably different length scales. So, I mean, you can just imagine that uh, this thing wants to stay, each sun particle is heavier than air, it's picked up by the air, it wants to stay in the air for a given amount of time and then fall down. So that depends on so many things like the particle size as well as its interaction with other particles of sand and many complicated things. So as a result, a particular length scale gets selected. So you can see a very characteristic length scale there, right? which is much, much bigger than one grain size. So then, like, this is characteristic of a lot of instability. And the question we are asking here is, I've created this small undulation here, extremely small undulation, and I'm going to ask the fact that I've made this undulation, is it going to increase the undulation or decrease it? This is the basic question we are asking. The fact that I made an uh, undulation, does the undulation act to increase itself or does it go away? So this is basically the stability question. Yeah. So when we are talking about linear instability, I told you about this very small perturbation that we are making. So when, when I do that, I can um, do this thing called linear stability. So what I mean by that is this. So I have an undisturbed state. So in my flow, I'm going to have a velocity u. That velocity u in the undisturbed state could be a function of x, y, and z. And that velocity is steady in time. And I'm perturbing it slightly to get a u total which is u bar of x, y, and z plus u hat, any perturbation of x, y, z n time. And then I say u hat is much, much less than u in general. I say it's much, much less, so I will... Um, Take this, put it back into my dynamical equations. In this case, it will be the Navier-Stokes equations. I will neglect all terms which are quadratic or higher in u hat. And then I will get an equation which is linear in u hat. Okay? And I'm trying to solve for u hat, right? And I'll try to understand what u hat is. When I do that, I can Fourier transform u hat and write an equation for the transformed variable, Fourier transformed variable. Is this clear? Yeah. Yes. Yes, I want to see whether that perturbation is growing or decaying in time. That's basically what I want to see. So I've made a perturbation in time. Yeah, what I will measure is the u total, but because I know the u base, I can subtract it out and get the u hat if I'm an experimenter. Now, as a theorist, I will uh, put these back into the equation and say that u hat is infinitesimal compared to u, and therefore I will neglect higher order terms in u hat. So I will get a linear equation in u hat, which I will then Fourier transform. Of course, like, uh, do I have to wait till it's linear to Fourier transform it? I'm allowed to Fourier transform anything, right? So I can Fourier transform anything. But the point is that... It's a very good point. So like I could uh, Fourier transform it, you know, I could write it as a Fourier sum if I didn't have a, uh, you know, uh, thing which extended from minus infinity to infinity. I could 
write it as a Fourier sum. Only if it's extending from minus infinity to infinity, I can write it as a Fourier integral. And so, um, typically what we'll do is we won't Fourier transform in all the four of these variables. We'll Fourier transform only in the variables which are, you know, uh, not changing in one direction or other. So the other variables, we'll solve for them directly. Of course, there also I could write it as a Fourier series and do things, but usually we don't do that. So, yeah, so here is my linear equation for this, which I will then Fourier transform. What does that buy me? It buys me that, so suppose I write the Fourier transform like this. You hat of x, y, z, and t is, I'll put four integrals, uh, u, which is my variable, and I've chosen y to not Fourier transform, I'll tell you why. So right now I'm imagining a simple flow through a channel where the pressure is pressure high on this side and pressure low on this side. There is a velocity profile. I'm imagining a flow like this. This direction I'm calling as y, and this direction x, z. Okay, I'm imagining a flow like this, and I will call it u of y e to the power i kxx plus kzz minus omega t. Dkx, dkz, d omega. Sorry, I needed only three integrals. Okay? So, and this goes from minus infinity to infinity in all the variables. So, I could write it in Fourier transform in this manner. And the point I'm trying to make here is, when I plug this back into the equations, each mode, each k, will act independent of any other k. Yes. Yes, there can be a big perturbation. We are not talking about that at this instant. We're talking about small perturbations. And yes, if there are big perturbations, you can get sometimes different behavior. We will talk more about that on Friday. We'll talk about what the amplitude of the perturbation can do to you. So typically what happens is that many systems have linear perturbations, by which I mean very, very small perturbations. And because of that, you get these patterns. Nonlinear perturbations typically do not result in very uh, clear patterns. But uh, they can result in patterns which are less regular and completely different. We will talk about that on Friday. It's a convention. We, because when you write the group velocity, it has to come out positive. So just to do that, you're writing it this way. U bar. That U bar? Yeah, it's the steady solution. It's, it's what happens if you did not, uh, uh, you know, put in any, th any function of time. So the point is, uh, there can be, in this case, like in channel flow, there's only one steady solution, which is parabolic. And that is the lamina solution. Uh, the turbulent solution is uh, um, uh, unsteady in time. It's not a steady solution anymore. So when this thing goes unstable, it goes towards a very chaotic state, which is unsteady. Yes. Under what conditions will it come back to U-bar? And under what conditions will it uh, not come back to U-bar and go to a new state? And that new state, like in this channel flow case, it's marching towards turbulence through a series of instabilities. 
all of which are not completely understood, by the way. Like the whole route to turbulence is not clearly understood. But in another case, like not channel flow, but let's say, you know, wrinkles on the skin or something, it can go to a new nonlinear state and settle down there. So that state can also be steady in time, or reasonably steady in time. Yeah, Floke is a more uh, a particular um, study out of the linear stability things. So in Floke analysis, what you normally do is you have a base flow, which itself is periodic in time. Whereas we are now talking about a steady base flow. So if you have a base flow, which is either periodic in time or space, then like to see the next instability of that thing, you will do a Floke analysis. It's steady. Other, yeah? Pardon? I did not put KY because I did not trans Fourier transform in the Y direction. I kept the Y direction as such. That is because this is the Y direction and there are two walls. In the other directions, it's extending from minus infinity to infinity and minus infinity to infinity. So I could, you know, write something special on this side, but right now I have not done that. I could write a Fourier series in the y direction, which I have not done right now. Because like when I start out with a dynamical equation, which is a partial differential equation, doing this is enough for me to bring it down to an ordinary differential equation. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah, so again in the sand problem, you can Fourier transform. So like you, you have this sand thing, you can Fourier transform in this direction and the direction coming out of the board. And you may not want to Fourier transform in this direction. There's no restriction, but things are different inside the sand and outside. So the sand is a solid object, right? Like Nietzsche, there's ground. So you may not want to Fourier transform in this direction. It's not the same. Minus infinity and infinity are not the same. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. You can do zero to infinity and a complicated Laplace transform, but it's not usually done because there are better numerical ways to do it. Yeah. No, the point is, the point is it's not an obstacle. Point is that initially at time equal to zero, when there was no wind, you had just a flat surface of sand. Okay, so let's say I sweep it very clean and make just a flat surface of stand, sand. The point is just being flat is unstable for sand. So sand always makes some pattern or other. So then you're making these minute undulations in the sand. And those minute undulations are then, so like once there is a minute undulation, this side becomes different from that side when wind is blowing here. So it picks up particles from this side and drops on this side. And that's why you saw like, you know, everything was depleted here and the whole wave was walking. It keeps on getting depleted here and makes the wave walk. Yes, yes, but, but, but the boundary itself is part of the solution. H is also part of the solution, yes. What is the role of you had? So the point is, here's my rigid ground. You can think of all this as movable matter. So then like I've got a U here, a U hat here, and then like that's interacting with, let's say, an H hat here. No, U hat can go all the way to infinity. You can make a perturbation which goes all the way to infinity. 
but the you had that's very the you that's very close to the boundary the total you is the guy responsible for picking up the particles of sand for saltating the sand and then that goes i mean then like this thing is held in the air for a small amount of time and then dropped again yeah yeah yes well like uh, we will come to that the thing is that when we solve for the omega we will get only positive values for all real problems so omega is actually part of the solution i'll come to that so omega is actually omega of kx and kz so it's not independent kx and kz okay so we'll come to that right now so basically i'll take a form like this i'll put it back into the partial differential equation and because each kx and kz mode does not talk to others i can solve for the inside you i can solve for the transformed variable for each k independent of other k that's what a linear perturbation buys me if i did a non linear then i would have you know uh, like convolutions of this into my problem and each k would depend on every other k is this coming across clear so that's the advantage of writing a linear problem and so we'll do that yes yeah yeah it is it is it is the fourier transformed variable i have just been lazy and not written it what yeah it's a function of kx ky and omega i'm sorry kx kz and omega so the omega is a function of kz and kx it has in in our case like when we talk about realistic problems ha huh? t goes from 0 to infinity but we are taking like we just writing the omega in that way in realistic so okay let me write write down what i'm saying so i will get a linear equation for the u okay so let's say i get a linear equation some linear operator of u will be equal to uh, omega times u i will get finally an eigen value problem like this on friday we'll try to work out a few examples we'll put uh, i mean we'll get finally the equation in this form so all i've done is i've taken this i've plugged it into the navier stokes and i've taken out each mode separately and that's all i've done nothing else neglected quadratic terms and then yeah i'm coming to your answer so then like i get a form like this okay this is a linear eigen value problem and why do i call it eigen value problem it's because uh, omega is unknown and this linear operator contains things like it could contain d by dy d square by dy square and so on it could also contain it will also contain kx and kz okay so knowing a left hand side that means prescribing a particular kx and kz i am going to ask what are the possible omegas okay and when i do this and i solve this eigen value problem i will get a whole spectrum of omegas for each kx and kz okay there can be a whole range of omegas for each kx and kz and those omegas could lie on a continuous spectrum so there can be an infinity of omegas or they could be a discrete spectrum where there is you know particular um, points of omega so you uh, remember what an eigen value problem is basically there is only special values of omega which will give you non trivial solutions of this everything else will give you trivial solutions okay so now what happens is when i plug back when i solve for the omega and i plug back into this even if i am integrating from omega equal to minus infinity to infinity all the us which are not part of the eigen value spectrum will be zero is this clear 
all the other u's will be zero. Only the particular omegas which are a function of kx and kz. For each kx and kz, there can be an infinity of omegas. But only those omegas are going to give a contribution to this integral. And in real flow situations, those omegas will be positive. They can actually be complex, but the real part will be positive. Okay, there's some theorems and things which show at least for some shear flows how the omegas will go, but we don't have time in two lectures to go into those. So those tell you the limits of the omegas and they will not be, you know, unrealistic ones. Is this answering your question? Yeah. Because it doesn't have a physical meaning, it doesn't appear in these problems. It doesn't appear because like when I solve for the eigenvalue spectrum, I don't get negative omegas. All the contributions to the negative omega are luckily zero. Huh? It turns out it's not negative because it's coming from a physical problem. If I write some arbitrary eigenvalue problem, I can of course get negative omegas. But in shear flows, you do not get negative omegas. There's also theorems which tell like what is your range of omega. Howard semicircle theorem and stuff like that. Omega can be zero. You can get a standing wave. You don't get negative omegas. Unless the flow itself is going in the negative direction. And then you can get, you know, something which is marching backwards. You're thinking about it with a negative omega. Yeah, in the, uh, when I write it down, yeah, when the flow is going backwards, I can think of that as X and, yeah, time, everything gets inverted. No, no, it can die, so I'm coming to that point. The point is, omega can be a complex quantity. Even if this is a real operator, you can get a complex eigenvalue, right? Now, omega, when it's a complex quantity, I will write it down as omega real plus i times omega imaginary. And then when I plug it back into this, I can pull out the imaginary part. So this will become omega real and times e to the power omega imaginary t because i i i i will be minus 1 and that will cancel this minus sign so i will get this so the sign of the imaginary part decides whether it's growing or decaying so if omega i is negative this whole thing will be dying in time so we are going to look for those omegas we are going to look at the imaginary part and we are going to ask is it growing or decaying by asking whether omega i is positive or negative. So like when I want to define a thing called stability, if I want to say this thing is stable, then I have to say that for all kx, all kz, and in each kx and kz for all the omegas, the imaginary part is less than zero. Only then it's stable. Even if one of them is greater than zero, it will be unstable. And that wavelength will get selected. Okay, so that's a good question. Like, lots of them will keep growing, but the guy who has the highest growth rate will manifest itself at large time. And you can actually show this by, you know, uh, if you take, um, as a function of wave number, if you take the growth rate. And then you can show that uh, if the, the maximum growth rate will uh, come in the form of a delta function. I can actually derive that for you over lunch. Yeah. No, no, no. If the growth rate is largest, it will be the one to manifest. It could be a small wavelength or a big wavelength. That wavelength will manifest itself, the one with the highest growth rate. Okay? <laughs> okay. So we talked about, I lost my that thing.
So we talked about uh, each mode being independent. And on Friday, I'll talk about how energy amplification can depend on all the modes, how the modes can combine together to give energy amplification. We'll talk in detail on Friday. The point is, like, when I look at the flow, can I make some general physical statements? And people make general physical statements all the time, which may or may not be true. So my point is, it may, you may or may not be able to write down general principles. So one thing which everybody talks about is that viscosity stabilizes everything. You've heard about this, right? We'll come to that in the next uh, slide. But uh, viscosity stabilizes everything. We'll see that that may or may not be true. So in general, you can think of, so suppose instead of, you know, a general profile like this one, suppose I had a profile which is like this. That means like somebody is going faster, somebody is going slower. Somebody is going faster, somebody is going slower. Viscosity is going to rub out these things, right? It's going to say, no, like you go faster and you go slower. So if I put a perturbation with many undulations in it, so viscosity is going to rub it out. So in general, viscosity is going to rub out, you know, perturb perturbations of uh, high frequency or high uh, wave number, right? So... But that doesn't mean viscosity stabilizes everything. I'm going to talk about cases where viscosity can create an instability where there was none. The second thing is surface tension stabilizes short waves. So uh, basically this is more or less true, but surface tension can also create instability, which we will come to. Normally people think of surface tension as only a stabilizing agent. What is surface tension? So suppose I have, let's say, oil and water and I have an interface between them. Then I perturb it like this. I perturb it like that. So then there's a surface tension, right? And the surface tension is going to act in this direction and this direction on this, whose resultant is going to be that way. It's going to act in this direction and this direction on this, whose resultant is going to be that way. So it is going to bring it back to horizontal. It doesn't like these curved things. So, and the more curvy I make it, high wave number I make it, the, the less surface tension likes it. So it's going to pull it out and make it horizontal. So this is one uh, no, normal principle, but that also may not always be true. And gravity stabilizes light over heavy. When there's light upstairs and heavy downstairs. So this is like, you know, a Diwali cracker which is sitting like this. So this is stable and if it is heavy over light, you can instinctively see that it's unstable. It's unstable and that instability is uh, manifested in the form of a baroclinic torque a rotation of the fluid flow, so which creates vorticity. So this is basically uh, what gravity does. We will see that this is also not overall true. You can have light sitting on top of heavy and instabilities created by that, double diffusive instabilities created by that. Okay, so let's start with the simplest thing we can think about, physical situation we can think about. You have a density stratified fluid. So in this fluid, density is low upstairs and high downstairs, exactly like in an ocean. Okay, so there's a stratification of density. And we're looking at a small neighborhood of this where we can think of the stratification as being linear. So here's a little cylinder whose original density is rho naught. And then you lift it up forcibly by a distance delta z. So that's the perturbation I'm giving to it. I've taken this cylinder which whose density is rho naught and placing it in a place which is lighter than this. So then what will happen? I've taken a blob of fluid from the heavier part and taken it to the lighter part. So here's a heavier blob of fluid sitting in between lighter fluid. What will happen to it? It will fall down. So then like when it comes back to its old place, it would have picked up some kinetic energy. So it will overshoot its old place. It will go down till a place where it's lighter than its surroundings. It will get pushed up. So it's going to do a simple pendulum like 
oscillation, simple oscillation. And uh, actually, you can write the Navier-Stokes so-called for this situation, which is just this. The uh, force balance equation is just so much. And I uh, will refer to this as stable stratification. Everybody refers to this as stable stratification because the density is high below and less above. So it's like this situation where there's light upstairs and heavy downstairs. This is termed as stable stratification. And so this is the equation. You can solve it. And for stable stratification, you can see that it will undergo merely oscillations. And the frequency of the oscillations will be given by this. It's called the brunt weissala frequency. So what will happen if there's viscosity? I've not included viscosity in that equation. It will damp out. So there will be a term which is proportional to a single dot of delta Z. And then you're going to get damped out oscillations. Without viscosity, it will keep going like this. And many uh, waves in the ocean go at this kind of frequency. Okay? Okay, now I've inverted the density stratification and made it heavy sitting on top of light. When heavy is sitting on top of light, you get the famous Rayleigh Bernard instability. So here you heated the bottom wall to a point where the, the thing fluid at the bottom is way lighter than the fluid on top by a certain amount given by a non-dimensional number called Rayleigh number. And when it exceeds a certain temperature difference, you start getting convection rolls. So, um, and then from the top it can look like this. And by red I've shown the um, hot parts and by blue the cold parts. So you're getting these plumes which are all in hexagonal shape. So this particular wavelength has been selected. And if there's surface tension in the problem, then the top, you know, instead of a top wall, if I had it open to the atmosphere, I can get funny behavior on top where surface tension interacts with this instability. And... Uh, hmm? In that pattern, just measure the distance between two things. I mean, see how often the thing is repeated, and 2 pi by that is your... No, that itself is your wavelength, and 2 pi by that is your wave number. Yeah, so this is the Rayleigh-Bernard instability. Rayleigh-Taylor instability is similar to Rayleigh-Bernard, like heavy on top, light below, but... Uh, this picture. Okay, so this is... So what I'm doing is I'm going on heating the downstairs one more and more and more. So what happens is beyond a particular temperature difference, I start getting simple, simple rolls like this. And so what happens to the flow is that uh, it keeps going in these nice rolls and that pattern remains there forever and ever. Okay, even if I come back after many days, the pattern will remain. It might have moved around a bit, but the wavelength, nothing else would have changed. Okay, whereas if I keep heating this even more and even more and even more, it goes through more and more and more instabilities. So this roll pattern thing goes through a secondary instability. And in order to understand that, I would have to do a Floquet analysis, like you said. So then I do that, and it goes through a secondary, and then blah, 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 till it reaches a very, very turbulent state. So this is just a photo of the very turbulent state. So where things are happening, there's plumes rising randomly. This is looking too regular. It will be much more random than this. And so there's a lot of boiling-like behavior going on, very violent behavior going on. There isn't. That's a very good question. So like once in a while, it all inverts. So that's what I mean, this pattern might have moved around. Sometimes the boundaries set a particular, you know, they, they correspond to one cold thing rising, but they could equally correspond to a cold thing falling because there's no symmetry. But once it gets stuck in that mode, it stays there for a while. And these time reversals and all are a very interesting question. Like they, they even can be related in a vague way to how the uh, ma magnetic north and south pole get reversed in the earth over time. So it's just that they get stuck in one particular thing for a while. 
and the Rayleigh Taylor instability is similar to Rayleigh Bernard except that it's a sharp interface. Normally, for the sharp interface, the word used is Rayleigh Taylor instability. There's various people defining it in different ways, but this is a reasonable working definition. So you see, like, you know, cold plumes falling and hot plumes rising. I should have put this as red and that as blue. Anyway, this is the thing. So since we're talking about geophysical situations, I thought I should bring an important instability here into the discussion, which is the double diffusive instability. And these are famously called salt fingers, which are observed in the ocean. This one is a you know, kitchen experiment of an ocean. So you see, the, this is actually an experiment, beautiful experiment, and you see double diffusive instability. So uh, the point here that I'd like to make is that the upstairs is lighter than the downstairs in this situation. Like I told you, in the ocean, it's stratified in that way. So then how do you get this instability? So like if I just say gravity stabilizes light over heavy, it's actually gravity which is causing these fingers. And how that works, I'll tell you in a minute. So suppose the upstairs water is warm and salty. And let's say, so the reason that can happen in the ocean is that in, on very, very hot days, you can get enormous evaporation on top. And that can actually make the top salty. It's still lighter than the thing below overall because temperature wins. But it can be saltier on top and cold and fresh on the bottom. So imagine a blob of fluid like this, a warm and salty blob, which has come into a cold and fresh region. Then what, what called double diffusive, the reason we call it double diffusion is that there are now two things which are diffusing out. One is heat and one is salt. Okay? Now they have very different rates of diffusion. So heat diffuses fast, salt diffuses very slowly. So the diffusivity for heat is like 10 to the minus 7 meter square per second. For salt, it's 10 to the minus 9. So a factor of 100 or so different. So then what will happen is this blob comes here. Its heat is diffused out. So from warm and salty, it becomes cold and salty. It's still salty because salt hasn't diffused out. So when it's cold and salty, what is it? Heavier or lighter than this neighborhood? Heavier. So it moves down a little more and moves down a little more. So you get a finger. Similar thing for a guy who goes up. He becomes warm and fresh, so he rises, rises, rises. So that's why you get these fingers in a situation which is otherwise stably, so-called stably stratified. Okay, so this is another counterintuitive thing, and you can work it out for yourself in pretty trivial way. So here I've given a blob of fluid, like let's say a cylinder of oil in a cylinder of in, in the surrounding water. So this is not moving, like that's hard to create, but imagine that it's not moving. Um, then you would think that this cylinder, if I put undulations on it, then the surface tension will not like those undulations. It should make it back into a cylinder, right? Incredibly, and you can work it out very trivially, you will see that the surface area decreases when you put undulations of a certain wave number. Because it's circular geometry, the surface area actually decreases. And when it decreases, it likes to go further and further in that direction and finally ends up in little blobs. You can do this calculation for yourself. It's called the Rayleigh Plateau instability. Another famous instability. Okay, this is a Safman Taylor instability where uh, um, basically, I have got the outside fluid as more viscous. So, yeah. Surface tension. It stabilizes more and more for shorter and shorter waves. Because the uh, shorter the wavelength, the more is the tension. More is the vertical component right, of getting it down. More is the... Uh, like stabilizing part of it. So, and, and the K will appear as K cube or K4 in various problems. So, that's why the more the wave number, 
that means the shorter the wavelength, the more is the stabilization. So this is another famous instability. I just wanted to go through a string of these. So in this instability, uh, what you have is a thing called a Heli-Shaw cell. It's basically two glass plates separated by a very, very small distance from each other. And this thing behaves almost like a porous medium. So and in a porous medium, you can write the pressure, you can approximate the pressure in this way. So then what you're doing is like Rupesh just put two glass plates he put a small hole in the top glass plate, this is a standard experiment, and put this purple tube through that. And through the purple tube, so initially he had only, uh, in this case he had castor oil in the whole plate. And then through the small tube he injected uh, mustard oil, which is yellow color. And you can see that that spreads out in this complicated way. And just for fun, through the mustard oil he put water. So he has three viscosities, but typically it's done with two viscosities. So this is an interesting question of how fluid two goes inside fluid one, which is already inside fluid zero. But uh, you can work out very simply that uh, this kind of the pressure gradient is in such a way that if the outside viscosity is more and the inside viscosity is less, then the pressure gradient will be in that direction. And it'll, if I take a small bit of purple fluid and put it in the white fluid, then if the white fluid is more viscous, this pressure gradient will be such that there will be high pressure behind and low pressure forward, so this will keep getting pushed outwards. So these fingers are created uh, because the outside fluid is more viscous. If the outside fluid is less viscous, like if I put uh, castor oil inside water, I will get nothing. I will just get a circular expansion. And this is another kind of instability which happens in polymers. So then uh, the substrate, um, the, the, this is, I actually will not go into this, it will take too long, I'm running a bit late. Uh, polymeric flows again display many kinds of funny instabilities. Uh, they can even stabilize. So elastic effects can stabilize or destabilize. So both of these can happen. So for example, a dolphin skin is supposed to stabilize the boundary layer outside it and make it more laminar and therefore a dolphin, you know, can go further by eating less, unlike a submarine. So this is another instability, the Taylor Kuwait. So uh, here, I have like two cylinders and fluid between the two cylinders. And let's say the two cylinders rotate differentially, like this one rotates at omega i, that one rotates at omega o. So they're both rotating at their own rates, two solid cylinders. And this is an experiment you can make uh, for yourself and look at the lovely patterns you get in the normal direction. It's a beautiful ex experiment. You should look it up on YouTube, the Taylor Coet. So here you can show that if I take a blob of fluid at radius A and a blob of fluid at radius RB and I interchange these two blobs and I give that as my perturbation, then the change in kinetic energy, I can show that it will grow and grow. So if, if the outer one, if the inner cylinder is rotating way faster than the outer cylinder. If the outer cylinder is rotating, this thing will stay, this thing will be stable. This uh, like will uh, uh, decay. The kinetic energy de delta Ke will decay and in the other case it will increase. So this is a simple algebraic experiment. How my angular, uh, how my kinetic energy changes when L and LB and LA are my angular momenta. And we come to the famous kelvin helmholtz instability. All of you have seen these patterns. You've all heard about kelvin helmholtz instability? Yeah? Okay. So in order to understand that instability, uh, we will first talk about a Rossby wave. So for us, I mean, there are Rossby waves in the Earth's um, atmosphere and those are very complicated waves also in the oceans and we are talking about a very very simple model of what we call as the Rossby wave. There's no rotation in this and there's nothing in it. There's just flow looking like this. There's flow 
which is steady up to this, I mean, above this line, and there is a constant shear below this line. So this is my model flow. And so uh, what is the vorticity up there? It's, what is vorticity? Curl of the velocity vector, right? It's zero up there. What is it down here? Is it constant, not constant, positive, negative? Huh? Vorticity is basically curl of the velocity vector and it's considered positive if it's anticlockwise. Huh? This one is constant because it's a straight line. du by dy is a constant. And it is positive or negative? Negative because it's clockwise. Right? So basically I have zero vorticity above this line and a constant negative vorticity below this line. So this is a model uh, flow situation that I'm talking about. And now what will happen to this? I put a perturbation of this interface. Just the place where this uh, slope starts, I'm, in I'm, tilt I'm uh, perturbing that one with a particular wavelength here. So regions inside this will have negative vorticity, right? Right or no? Yeah. And regions here will have positive vorticity. The, def the, the change in vorticity will be positive here because from a negative value it went to zero. Here from zero it went to a negative value. So the change in vorticity is negative there, positive here and so on. What does this buy you? So <clears throat> when they, whenever there is a vorticity, by the Stokes theorem, if this is the curl of the velocity vector, you will get an induced velocity. So dA is any elemental area inside which there's a vorticity. So I'm just pretending there's a one small point vortex here in a small area dA with a circulation gamma. That circulation will give rise to a velocity in this direction and this thing will be a tangential velocity. So effectively what I'm saying is, if I have a point vortex here, it will give rise to a So like if I have a point vortex here, and this was my unperturbed interface, and if the vorticity is positive below, then it will give rise to, positive is anticlockwise. I'm only drawing it wrong. It will give rise to a velocity in this direction, an induced velocity. Similarly, the negative vorticity here will give rise to an induced velocity in that direction. Perpendicular to the line, perpendicular to that line. And finally, the resultant will be in this direction. So I will have a downward velocity of that point, similarly an upward velocity of this point. So just imagine the anticlockwise one is doing this, the clockwise one is doing this, so uh, on an average, I mean, uh, as a result, in the net, this one is going down, and that one is going up. So what happens now is that this thing which was staying at this location has gone down. So now I'm getting a wave like this. This one has gone down and that one has gone up. So then my zero location, my zero location goes here. So on a net, this wave is moving leftwards. You can just think about it for five minutes and you'll see that on an average, this wave is going leftwards. Okay, so a Rossby wave propagates in this direction. So spontaneously, just by creating a velocity profile like this, I've created a wave which is propagating in this direction and it's neutral, it's not dying or growing. If I just put a perturbation, it will just propagate in that direction. Is that okay? Now, the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability can be thought of as two Rossby waves sitting next to each other. Okay? Kelvin-Helmholtz instability happens when <laughs> there's a jump in velocity. So the velocity there is high and the velocity here is low or there's any kind of change in velocity. So then like this thing, 
grows and grows and grows, and then non-linearly it starts rolling up. So this is basically the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability. Anytime there's a sharp change in velocity, you'll get a Kelvin-Helmholtz instability. And this profile of velocity you can think of as a, uh, it's called a mixing layer. So I've just made it in three straight lines just to trivialize it and understand the physics. So we can think of it as three straight lines. And here is a Rossby wave which we talked about earlier. And this wave was moving in which direction? This direction. Similarly, this wave will move in that direction because it's all ulta. So you can again work it out and you'll show that it moves in that direction. So you have a wave moving in this direction and a wave moving in that direction. And they are at a distance 2b. So if 2b is very, very large, they won't see each other. It will be a neutral situation. That guy will go in his way. This guy will go in his way. And there will be two Rossby waves, which are propagating in opposite directions. And nothing more will happen. But imagine if they come closer and closer. Then what happens is, I told you about vorticity inducing a velocity. So this vorticity will start inducing a velocity on that guy. Right? So they will start talking to each other. And you can actually work it out for yourself in a thought experiment. These things will slow down each other. These two waves will now slow down each other and make each other freeze. Okay? And everything depends on, at the point where they're frozen, what is the phase? Whether it's stable or unstable depends on the final phase when they're frozen. And neither is moving left or right, and they're sitting in one place. So then, like this phase that I've drawn is for an unstable situation. So you can see that here is a negative vorticity, which means clockwise. And this clockwise vorticity will introduce a pull in the downward direction on that interface. So when, there's, when the phase is like this, this, thing, this vorticity is the nearest to that guy. So the effective net thing will be a downward displacement. So uh, part of the interface that was already negatively displaced will get even more negatively displaced. So it will pull on that and it will make this instability grow. If the phase was such that this was positive and that was also positive, you will see that the resultant will be in the upward direction and it will stabilize. So everything depends on the phase in which these two are frozen. Okay, so that is basically the mechanism of the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability. <laughs> you can, you know, make it, you know, a smooth profile and do a very complicated eigenvalue problem numerically and you will get a very, very similar answer. Yeah, if you have one more shear layer, then again it depends on where they freeze. You could have another shear layer, another density layer. So there's a Taylor-Goldstein instability, which has a density layer sitting there. Goldstein. Yeah, which has a density layer sitting on there, and that can stabilize, destabilize, depending on the distance, and basically depending on the phase. OK? We have to see like how they three are interacting with each other. Okay, and then like the phase at which they'll get frozen. So like, so long as you have like layers where sudden changes are happening, like the one, like the one in our model here, you can write it down analytically. Yeah, that will automatically come out from the egg mode. The phase will automatically come out in the eigen mode. The eigen mode, whenever you say mode, you mean an entire shape of the perturbation from there to here. In that, the phase will be inherent. Because the eigen mode itself is a complex quantity. So phase is built into it. Oh, five minutes. Oh, yeah, I have to actually stop here. Should I stop here and continue on Friday? There's actually a lot more. Okay, so uh, 
So basically, I wanted to show how these things come, like the equations. Maybe that I can do on Friday. Let me quickly go down the thing to see what's coming. And uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about this thing. So yeah, I will just talk about this thing and uh, stop for today. We will go back and um, worry about it. So till now, we've been talking about many uh, first instabilities. We talked about Rayleigh Plateau, like how that thing is unstable. We talked about Taylor, Safman. We talked about many of those things. Most of those, many of those things may not lead to turbulence, like Rayleigh Plateau will just end up in the whole cylinder breaking into blobs, breaking into circles, and, I mean spheres and staying there. So we now want to talk about shear flows where actually the first instability is just the first in a series of events which takes you towards turbulence. And this is a nice picture hand drawn by Roddam Narsimha which explains what happens on a boundary layer. So a boundary layer is a very good lab for turbulence because all the Reynolds numbers happen in the same flow. So as you go downstream in a boundary layer, what's a boundary layer? So take this table and put flow past it. And you'll get a region next to the table which is moving far slower than the rest of the flow. And that slowing down region, which is growing as you go downstream in the table, is called the boundary layer. And so depending on the thickness of that boundary layer, you have a Reynolds number which is changing as you go downstream. So like uh, the Reynolds number can be low here, higher, higher, higher as you go down. So you're going all the way from lamina to turbulent in a series of instabilities. So this is the kind of picture that happens in a boundary layer. Now the main point I want to make is that that is not the canonical route to turbulence. Most of the time you get like completely different things, uh, completely different routes to turbulence, completely different Reynolds numbers at which you get turbulence. Normally you think about high Reynolds number as turbulent, low Reynolds number as laminar. So. Um, how high is high? That's a question, right? So for a jet or something, for a, a plume like this, which is coming out of a chimney, even 100 can be turbulent. For elastic turbulence, you can get turbulence at Reynolds number very close to zero when there's polymer. That same polymer, you can create drag reduction and keep it more or less laminar at a much higher Reynolds number when it's in a pipe like this. So like funny things can happen. And uh, in pipe flow and channel flow, and this is very, very important for us, in pipe flow and channel flow, in these things like the jet and the boundary layer, we saw that as the Reynolds increases, you get instability, then simple growing waves, then something more, then some better pattern, more complicated pattern, and then turbulence. In pipe and channel, the instability Reynolds number is higher than the Reynolds number at which you see turbulence. So at a situation where you've done the stability analysis for your lamina flow, you are getting all the imaginary parts of omega as negative. So everything is telling you that the flow is stable, you get turbulence. So what created that turbulence? So that is this whole concept of transient growth, which we'll talk about on Friday. So this is uh, a very, very interesting scenario where you're getting turbulence without uh, linear instability. So you can get this whole range of behavior and there's no general rules as we talked about. And the last thing I'll tell today is that when you change even a little bit of something, sometimes you get a very, very big change in the stability. So here, what do I mean by critical Reynolds number? In the boundary layer, we talked about the first instability. At very low Reynolds number, everything is stable. Okay, so every omega i is less than zero. So uh, whatever be the kx and kz, at the critical Reynolds number, there'll be one particular value of kx or kx, kz, one particular combination, which will show the first omega i crossing a zero, the first growth, okay? And that thing is called my critical Reynolds number. I've plotted this for a channel, and this is just a channel which has the walls which are slightly inclined at an angle alpha. Okay, they could be converging with negative alpha or diverging with positive alpha. You see the size of that alpha in degrees. 
You can't even see it in a pipe. And look at how the critical Reynolds numbers change by many orders of magnitude. So there's a lot of singularity going on here, a lot of things going on in this. So it's very, very hard to predict the correct answer for linear instability very often. And we'll stop here and continue on Friday. Thanks. <laughs>